Hello again, uh, everyone, and welcome again. So we are first uh, going to talk a little bit about uh, the Report Miner. Um, I'm assuming most of you are already familiar with, uh, with the product uh, because uh, most of you have already either uh, used the product or have seen the videos of the product uh, or actually you are already a customer. Um, so uh, what I'm going to be doing is I will start with an overview of the product and then we'll look into some common challenges or actually common use cases that we have seen and where uh, we believe that uh, we add a lot of value and we'll go through those use cases one by one in details. Um, so starting with uh, what is Report Miner? Um, it's a complete integration software for unstructured data. That is, uh, it can take data from the, uh, the source, that is unstructured source, extract the data based on uh, your logic and uh, run it through the system where you can do your data conversion, data quality checks, and write it to destination of your choice and have the whole process automated. So this is complete automation process. Uh, it, in, it automates your entire business process around ingestion of unstructured data. Uh, some common formats that uh, we encounter for unstructured data documents, such as PDFs, very common, uh, Word docs, uh, PDF forms, uh, text files, uh, sometimes RTF, uh, sometimes uh, reports come in Excel files, XLS and uh, uh, the XLSX as well. <clears throat> and uh, these are different kind of uh, documents that we encounter. Uh, so data can be in any of these sources and uh, as long as it does not have any defined structure, it, is not, it does not have tabular structure where it has superfluous data and you need to pick and choose data from such documents and extract those data points this is the tool to be used. So, um, apart from extraction part that I talked about, uh, it has a deep set of features to do data scrubbing. Uh, that is data cleaning, uh, you're doing the cleansing of the data, making sure it is uh, conforming to your quality standards so you can write your business rules actually uh, to verify the quality of data. You can have a reusable set of uh, uh, business rules and you can apply it anywhere in, inside the process to ensure that the quality of data is maintained and the data that is uh, actually used downstream is conforming to your standards. Uh, it has a uh, built-in data conversion and transformation features as well. Uh, so if you need to do ETL kind of processing of your data, that is already built in. So actually our product uh, has, uh, at, at the heart of it, actually it is an ETL product and it is uh, uh, designed, of course, uh, to focus on uh, unstructured data uh, that is uh, coming in forms of reports and similar documents, but it does have all the conversion and transformation feature. So if you want to merge uh, some data streams together, split them into multiple uh, streams, or do any calculations such as normalizing, denormalizing, sorting, filtering, and so on and so forth, all those features are built in. So you can design your process, actually, for your data transformation as well inside the product. And uh, it has actually built-in connectivity to a variety of connectors uh, on the destination side. You can send data to something as simple as an Excel workbook uh, or a CSV delimited files, flat files, or uh, you can go to XML or you can go to even high-end databases. Uh, actually, we support all leading vendors on the market, <clears throat> such as a SQL Server, um, Oracle, <clears throat> excuse me, IBM DB2, Postgres, MySQL, Sybase, to name a few. Uh, in fact, you can write into uh, some applications as well, uh, such as if you want to connect to your CRM system, such as Salesforce.com, uh, Microsoft uh, Dynamics CRM. Uh, you want to write to a cloud database. Uh, you want to write to any published uh, interfaces, or you can go to even uh, 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 web services, and you, you can send data directly to those destinations. So those connectors are actually built in. And it can automate, as I said, the entire process end-to-end. -end. So beginning from taking the data from your unstructured set of documents, going all the way to your destination, and along the way, doing all the data scrubbing, data cleaning, uh, data quality verification, data convergence and transformation, the entire process can be designed in a visual way. And uh, the idea is that you can design this entire process with a drag-and-drop interface, and you don't need to write a single line of code or scripting. That's what is our promise, that you can design the entire process inside the visual designer and actually deploy it from the designer itself. Uh, it comes with built-in scheduler uh, with uh, actually batch and real-time processing. So in fact, you can process your data in real time. 
So as soon as the data arrives, it can go through your system and get processed. And we'll see actually uh, one of the samples today. So here is a list of uh, some scenarios that we have uh, seen in past and we believe uh, that everyone can benefit uh, by looking into these use cases. And this is what we are going to be focusing on in today's webinar. Uh, the first one is uh, handling variable records. So <clears throat> a little bit of background. Uh, for uh, data extraction models, when you build your, your patterns or you, when you build your data regions, uh, typically, those records are one uh, one line uh, in height, but in some cases, uh, they are more than one. They may be two, three, four, but uh, in majority of the cases, they are fixed height of the, the record, but in some cases, you don't know beforehand that how, uh, how high the record is going to be, and in that case, uh, if the height is uh, uh, and, uh, not fixed, in that case, to handle that can be a problem, and we have actually built-in features to handle that, and we'll be looking into that. Uh, then <clears throat> next is the, the counterpart of data regions is data fields, and sometimes data fields are not at fixed location inside a uh, data region. They are floating around. Sometimes uh, uh, they can be found on the same line. Sometimes they are not even on the same line. They could be anywhere. So how to handle that? That will be our second topic. Then we'll be looking at uh, using multiple patterns for complex structures. How to handle that? If you have uh, a scenario where one pattern is not good enough, so that will be our third topic. Then the fourth will be actually a, uh, will be studying uh, the case for splitting into multiple models. So typically one extraction model is good enough, but in some cases it's uh, recommended to use multiple models for the same data file, and we'll be looking at those uh, uh, those use cases as well. <clears throat> then we'll be uh, looking at uh, data quality uh, rules. This is, this is basically the verification process, and uh, actually uh, I would say the most important part of the process where it ensures the data quality of your entire process, and we'll be focusing um, on that use case uh, in this topic. And then the last two topics uh, for today's session will be focusing on automation. The first one is actually the real-time folder watching. So when the data arrives from outside, can it be processed automatically as soon as the data arrives? Uh, without any, any human intervention? Yes, you can, and we'll be looking at that use case. And then uh, the last but not the least is uh, very important, <clears throat> where uh, we'll be looking into classification of files and matching with corresponding extraction logic. Uh, it's a very common use case to see that uh, you receive a mixed bag of files, a different kind of files, and a large batch, um, and you have built extraction models for uh, some types of the files, but uh, if you have to go through the files one by one and match it with the right data model, uh, sorry, the extraction model, it can take quite a bit of time and that defeats the purpose of automation. But we do have features to automatically go to the file collection and figure out what type of file uh, each of the files is and match it with the corresponding extraction logic and run it through the process. And we'll look at, the, look at that use case as well. So this is the first topic, and uh, this is where we are going to be handling, uh, uh, looking into how to handle uh, the variable record height. So in some reports, the data record uh, may span unknown number of rows, where you don't know beforehand that how many rows uh, uh, is going to be forming one record. Uh, so we have uh, uh, some features built in to handle this, and uh, uh, the feature that is going to be used is uh, use, using uh, region and type. And it has actually three options. Uh, the first one is uh, read till a blank line is encountered. So <clears throat> in place of specifying a fixed height of a data region, you can say that keep reading till you find a blank line. Uh, second option is uh, keep reading till the last field in the data region is encountered. So uh, here it will keep reading till it uh, even the last field is found. And then uh, the third option is to read till another region is encountered. This one is actually uh, uh, dependent on other regions. So it uh, should be carefully used, but can be very powerful. But it can keep reading till the next region is encountered. So it makes it truly independent of uh, the height. It can keep reading um, until the next sibling is found or next uh, 
uh, header or footer is found or next parent is found. Uh, so it can keep reading till any data region is found as an <clears throat> at the next level. So let's have a look at this uh, example. So I will hand it over to Brittany. Uh, Brittany, do you mind uh, showing us the example for this uh, uh, use case? So let's get into Report Miner. So actually, um, one thing I'm going to mention just because um, you guys are seeing my screen right now, as you can see to the very left, I have um, under the Project Explorer the, an entire project that contains all the files I'm going to be using for this webinar. I just wanted to make note of that, that, that that's something that we actually have in Report Miner that makes it really easy to access all of your files, like your report models, your data flows, your workflows, and then the actual um, source files. So I'm going to go into the first example we're going to be showing you that is going to showcase what Jay just spoke about with the region height varying. So let us get into that. So um, first I'm actually just going to create a new report model. And this report model is going to um, contain the extraction logic. But the first step to creating a report model is to go to File, New, and select Report Model. And here is where you will uh, select the file that you need to extract the data from. This is the report options window. So I'm going to go ahead and select that file in sample one and click OK. So here you can see a very simple text file with um, names, ID number, phone numbers, email, and company information. So in this scenario, the lines are varying depending on, or for each name. Uh, in a, a simple case, every name would be one line, but in this case, it varies. Some, line, some names have two numbers, as you can see here in the first one. Um, some names have company that lasts for two or three lines. So um, for this scenario, this is where we will use those extra options that will uh, solve this um, type of use case. So I'm going to start off by just creating my data region that will um, extract or so we can specify the pattern. So the first step to creating your data region is to right click on this record node and select add data region. And then um, the next step is to then specify a pattern. So we're telling this uh, report miner what lines we're needing. So I need every line, every line with the name. So every, you can see here a common pattern. Every um, one of these names has an ID number. So I'm just going to use that. I'm going to use our built-in pattern matching, match any digit. So again, you can even see here that uh, because I've specified the pattern, it's still, uh, it's capturing the lines that I need, but it's not capturing those extra ones that uh, have more than one line. So um, how I'm going to capture that is first, let me just um, add all of these data fields. So I'm going to add, and this is how you um, add the data fields. You just highlight and um, highlight the field area, right click and say add data field. So I'm going to do that for each field. So we have our name, the ID, the phones, the email, and the company. So now we need to actually make some adjustments to the properties. So we have um, for data regions, if you right click on the data region in the model layout, you, there's an actual um, option here called region properties. So this is what Jay was talking about, the region end type. So right now it's using the line count, so it thinks that every uh, region is only one line. But if we actually adjust this, we can change it. Um, like uh, Jay was saying, there's different options, blank line, last field ends. Um, in this case, we're just going to say another region starts. Click OK. So now you can see that now everything is highlighted in gray. That means it's going to capture that information. The last step is to then adjust the properties for the actual field that is varying in height. So that was phone numbers and company. So we actually need to change the uh, field properties. So you can right click on the actual field and select field properties. And um, in this case, we're going to be adjusting the height. So in the height, it's currently using uh, lines to know how um, what the height is. It's using one line, but if we change that to till region ends, then we will be able to capture everything correctly. So we have our numbers, and then we can do that for the company as well. So field properties, and then change that to till region ends, and click OK. And now we have all of our information captured. And if I preview, 
we'll see that that information that extra information is within each field. So that um, solves the uh, case of when the height varies for the region. So you just have to adjust those feature or those options within the properties. Let's look at the second use case, and uh, this is closely related to what we saw in the last use case, where we are talking about handling variations in field locations. So typically, the data fields are tied to a, a relative location, uh, and actually it is a relative to the top left corner of the data region. So referring to the last example that we saw, you could see that each data region was uh, in the beginning one line, and then we made it height uh, made height uh, variable, and then uh, still all the fields were specified with the location. For example, the name was supposed to start at the first character and go for a certain number of characters, then email ID, and then phone numbers, and so on and so forth. But each of them they are tied to a certain location inside the data region that you were, uh, were basically we're specifying that what is the starting. Uh, location and how wide it's going to be. So that is uh, indeed uh, the case for majority of the reports, but in some cases that is not true. In some cases, uh, uh, your fields are not tied to a specific location, uh, uh, and there are actually two possibilities that we have seen. Um, the first one is the field is floating. It could be anywhere inside the entire row. As long as uh, it is inside one single row, uh, it could be floating anywhere inside that row. It could be starting from the very first character or all the way to the end. It could be found anywhere. So that is one uh, possibility. And second is it could be anywhere inside the entire data edition. So uh, again, referring to the last example, if you had a data edition that is not one line, that is two or three lines, the field could be anywhere inside it. How do we find that? Uh, for Typically for such fields, uh, you will have some kind of a marker or identifier that will help you uh, identify that uh, field uh, reliably. So for example, uh, if you have a field that says name colon and then, then the name appears or the address colon and the address appears. So such markers or such levels can be used uh, to identify those fields anywhere inside the data region. So these are the two possibilities. Starting with the first one, when uh, the floating uh, data is found, the data field could be anywhere inside the line. And if you look at the screenshot, if you look at the contact name, uh, the contact name in the first record on the line number one is uh, at certain location. And line number six, the counterpart in second record, you can see the Josephine, uh, that contact name has shifted to the right. So that means the, the field is not tied to a certain location. It could be found anywhere inside the line but it is in the same line. Uh, in that case, uh, the feature that is used is a floating field feature. It is tied to floating patterns, and we'll see uh, an example, uh, in, uh, in, uh, and Brittany will show you the real example and how this works. Uh, can you move to the second slide, please? And uh, the second uh, type is, uh, as I said, uh, how to handle uh, a data field that could be found anywhere inside the data region and as long as it has a keyword. So it is actually indeed keyword based search. Uh, this is the <clears throat> option that can be used uh, to find your data based on a keyword inside a data region. So you specify the keyword and uh, that will take care of searching for your data field inside that data region itself. And uh, actually there are uh, two uh, different options for that. One is where uh, the keyword is uh, going to be preceding your data field immediately. So for example, you find address colon and then following which you find the address field. In some cases, you will see that the address colon appears and the field value starts just below that in the next line. In that case, you can use the option uh, the way you see in the screenshot. It says after the string address colon in previous line. So if it is in the same line, you use the current line option. If it is found in the previous line, you use the previous line option. And these keywords uh, are basically uh, the search keywords that will be searched inside the entire data region. And it could be found anywhere. Uh, say uh, your data region can spans uh, um, you know, tens of lines or maybe hundreds of lines. doesn't matter. It will scan the entire data region and find wherever the, uh, the keyword appears and following which 
um, or just below that uh, the data data value appears, it will uh, extract that value. Now there is one more variation to this. Uh, in some cases, one keyword is not enough. You have multiple keywords. So for example, in this uh, screenshot, we see address colon. Um, how about uh, you have another one where it just says ADDR, the short form of address, and you want to use that as well. So you want to say match address colon or ADDR colon. So you can do that too. All what you need to do is you specify those two separated by a comma. So you will say address colon, uh, then comma, and then sp specify the second alternative keyword as well. So you can specify as many as you want. It will search for all those keywords and wherever the data value is found, matching with any of the keywords, your data will be extracted. So that's how you can handle the, the, the data that, can, that is going to be found using a keyword inside a data region. So Brittany will show you an example of uh, these two. So please take over, Brittany. All right, let me go ahead and get back into Report Miner. Okay, so let's uh, create a new report model, and I'm going to actually show you an example. Um, it's actually the screenshots that you saw. So let's go to File, New, and Report Model, and then I'm going to point to that file, which is in the sample two. Okay, so um, in this file, this is just um, a text file with account and contact and address. And as you can see, contact is not positioned in the same spot for each um, record. So that's what, where we're going to utilize that feature that Jay was talking about, the floating feature. So let us uh, create our data region by right-clicking on the record node and selecting Add Data Region. And now we can type in our pattern in the pattern box. So I'm just going to use that first location for the first record. And I'm going to type over contact, the word contact for my pattern. And you can see that it's only capturing the first one because that's the only one that's in that location. But again, once I uh, select that floating pattern, which is located right up top um, under the pattern properties, you can see now that it's capturing every line that contains that pattern, no matter the position. So uh, once we do that, then we can actually just go in and uh, highlight and add the data field and shift it around so we can capture all of the information. So we have that contact. So it really is just that simple as far as the float field. All you need to do is type in the pattern and select that floating pattern. Um, and it automatically knows the positioning as well because of this float fields option. If I unchecked it, it would just be positioned exactly the same. But it, when we have this checked off, it will um, position it correctly, exactly how it's positioned for the first one. So, um, and then now I can actually show you the start position that we were talking about. So in this same example, we can also use that with the address because um, let me increase the line count so I'm actually capturing the address info. So if I increase it to five, I will now be capturing the address information in each record. And I can um, highlight the address field and select Add Data Field. And you can see here that when I do that, it's all over the place because it's using the floating option right now. But we can adjust that by, um, and then also this is positioned wrong too. It's not even capturing the the um, all the address here. So I can actually fix that in the field properties with that start position. So I'm going to select the after string and then I'm going to type in that keyword address because we want to basically get all of the data that's um, under address. So we use the keyword address and you want to type it exactly how it appears in the report and um, select in previous line because it's in the previous line and then click OK. Now everything is positioned correctly. If we preview, you can see the name and the address has been captured correctly. All right, so let's look at the next use case and that is uh, handling complex structures. So starting with the patterns, a little bit of uh, introduction or actually overview of the patterns. The patterns is uh, uh, a set of either uh, static keywords or 
you can use the variable patterns using our wildcards such as match any digit, alphabet, alphanumeric, and so on and so forth. And uh, you can have them tied to a certain location, or you can have them floating, you can have them ended, or and all that. The idea is that this, the pattern that you specify is what is going to be used to reliably identify your record of interest from the file. So that's what is the meaning of or the, the purpose of the pattern. Now, uh, in some cases, uh, you will see that having just one pattern is not enough. You will see that you, know, you need uh, uh, to specify uh, the alternate, uh, alternatives uh, to, to the, the, the first pattern that you have specified. Uh, let's look at this uh, screenshot that we, that we have in the slide. Here, if you look at uh, the, the records, kind of simple data, but you see that uh, there are some uh, values. So if you look at the row number 2, 5, 8, 11, and so on and so forth, whatever is in high, uh, whatever is in dark background, the gray background, uh, you see the first field is the name of the person. Second field is uh, some dollar amount in certain cases. Sometimes it says no dues. Sometimes it says waived. So you see here, if I'm using that pattern, um, you will see that uh, in most of the cases there will be some dollar value, but in some cases there is no dollar value and there are some keywords used like no dues and waived and all that. So in this case, uh, if you have to account for the records where it is not dollar value, how would you go about it? And, and, uh, and mind it, we are, we are looking specifically at the pattern here. So uh, if you have to specify these as uh, different patterns, you can do that by changing the number of patterns being used. And that is one option that is called pattern count. We allow up to five patterns. And as you can see in the patterns uh, screenshot, the first one um, has dollar sign to, to identify that this is where the data is starting, or it can be called waived, or it could be called uh, no dues, actually it just says no, but you, know, you can use no dues whole keyword. So you can have any of these patterns, and, and uh, the way it works is these patterns are going to be used uh, uh, in conjunction with each other. So when application is looking for your records, it will look for any of the patterns. So any of the patterns is matched, it's a match. And that's what is using multiple patterns match. And let's have a look, uh, look at the example. We're going to go ahead and actually use that example that you saw on that screenshot and just so I can show it to you guys in action. So let's uh, create another report model, file new report model, and this time I will select that file. Okay, so like Jay said, very simple data, but um, in that particular field, uh, there's different patterns that we want to use to identify uh, to capture that record. So if I select Add Data Reagent, um, my pattern box will appear. And then this is the pattern count right um, here where my cursor is uh, under the region properties. Uh, by default, it's always going to be set to 1, but uh, we have the or we allow for five. So if I increase the pattern count to five, I can use as, as up to five patterns. So in this case, I, don't, I think we only need to use four. So I'm just going to use the, the due amount. So in the first one, it's zero. And the majority of them, it's using the dollar sign. So that will capture the three records. And then uh, we have the, the, the no dues. And um, waived and actually even the none is being captured because I have the pattern no so it's actually capturing that one so yeah I only need four patterns here so and then you can just um, go in and oops, let me do that again and then you can just go in and then add your data fields like we have been doing with the previous two examples so just highlighting right clicking and selecting add data field and by the way, if you, um, you see here how um, as I'm highlighting, I'm not really capturing some of it's missing or if I, we have buttons up here that if you need to adjust where it's capturing. So if I want to increase it or move it, I can do that with these button, these ruler buttons up here. So yeah, that is the example of pattern matching. All right, so now we, uh, come to the use case of uh, splitting into multiple models. So this, uh, actually it is uh, one of the best practices and uh, this comes from experience. We have seen uh, quite a few 
uh, use cases where the document itself dictated that we should not be using one report model for this document. We should have more than one. How do we identify that which one? Uh, what, what kind of uh, uh, documents they require to have more than one model applied on the same document type? So the first use case is uh, when the documents contain disjoint or independent data sets. As in uh, one document has uh, uh, certain parts of it as one type of data as uh, it, it relates to certain type of uh, business entities or business data and second type of data is also in the same document and they have nothing to do with each other. They are completely disjoint, they are completely independent. So naturally, though they are contained inside the same file, they are not related to each other. So there, there is no reason that we should be using one big extraction model or report model that contains logic to extract both of them and then and in, in, in the export you're sending them to two different destinations anyways. So in such cases it's always a best practice to create an extraction logic for uh, uh, different type of data sets independently and uh, have the same document run through two different models. And so basically you're talking about two different passes through two different extraction models and get desired data sets as output. So that one I think is kind of uh, obvious, and but no, uh, in, in a lot of cases when we receive documents, we don't pay attention to that. And we tend to create one model because it is one document. So this is not always one model to one document type. You can have multiple models working on the same document type, especially when you have a document that contains different types of records and they are not going to be exported in the same destination or they are not going to be related, uh, then in that case we recommend that you have different report models for each of them. Now second use case is uh, when you have incons inconsistent layouts where, uh, or varying formats. So in some cases what happens that it is impossible to have just one uh, a report extraction logic that is going to be getting all the data out of that document. Uh, and uh, if you start accounting for variations, what happens that uh, in no time the model becomes very, very complex. So in that case, you can break it down into smaller models and uh, then daisy chain, so to speak, to all the results and put them together. So in that case, what you're doing is basically uh, you are doing divide and conquer you are creating smaller models and running these models in a sequence on the same file and collecting data and putting that data together into one destination. So it, actually it is a, a good practice to, to do this because A, it is easy to maintain um, and B, of course, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, very easy to build uh, because you don't have to worry about uh, um, a, a large model where you have to uh, to go go into it and uh, uh, make sure all the uh, all the patterns are coming together, all the data regions uh, are looking good and the fields looking good and all that. And if you have a complex model, it it becomes kind of difficult. So we uh, we recommend it to be broken down into smaller models and they work on individual di different types of records and then combine the data together in the destination. So this is the use case uh, I was referring to where we have uh, one file, so if you look at the top part, it has some data that is aligned this way. And second part, if you look at the data, it is similar data, but it is uh, not aligned properly. You see that uh, the records are, in this case, they are split into two lines in, in this case. So here you have name, phones, email, and the company. Basically, we, see, we saw the same data in one of the examples earlier. Now the second page, the same data is uh, name, phone number, email goes into the second line, and then the company uh, next to it. So this is the same data, but the structures are very different, and it can happen. And uh, may not be the same data, maybe different data, but if you have different structures inside the same file, how do you handle that? We recommend that you split that into two models, and the models could be as simple as, if you look at the first model here, <clears throat> this first model actually, let me just point to the source file, sample four. So this is the first model, and you can see that it is not what it, uh, we are not worrying about the second uh, set of records at all. This is only working on the first set of records. And similarly, if I go back to my second model, this one actually works with the uh, second type of records and not with the first type. So let me just point to this. 
And then you can see here, it is getting the same set of records, same set of fields, but working with a different model altogether, where we have the different pattern and even the location of the fields and all that is different. So these two essentially are getting the same set of data, but using two different models. And now what we can do is uh, you can take the output of these two and combine them together. So in that case, your net uh, output is going to be exactly the same, but passing through two different models. So this is the use case that we talked about earlier. Okay, so this is the use case. Uh, let's move on to uh, the uh, next topic, the data quality rules. So data quality rules play a very important role in, in the entire process of uh, verifying the quality of data. And uh, we recommend that you, you use the data quality rules liberally in your processes because this is essential to ensure that you're getting 100% confidence in your data. Uh, you, uh, these rules are basically your own business rules. You specify and these are rules based and uh, they are reusable completely. So you can write uh, something as simple as make sure that the field value is always there. It cannot be blank. It's a very, very simple rule. And a lot of times uh, you may have seen someone using it manually to verify that when the extraction comes out, you are checking the, the field values are not blank sometimes. Sometimes uh, you're checking the values are not zero and so on and so forth. It could be as simple as that or it could be, it could be very complex where you're doing some calculations com and computations on certain fields, checking the ranges for the values. Uh, maybe you, know, you have more conditionals if then else logic. So you can have any kind of rule-based verification logic and that you can create a reusable set of such rules and apply it anywhere inside the process. Uh, if you see the screenshot here, we have uh, uh, in, the, in the bottom screenshot, you can see that there is, a, uh, there is a rule that says property tax cannot be zero. Simple rule, it looks like a formula, and that's what is one rule. You can have a collection of such rules, and you can apply it anywhere inside the process. As a result of these business rules or quality rules, uh, you can flag the bad records, the records not meeting your quality criteria. And these records, uh, of course, you can get exact location of where these are found and uh, why they were flagged. You can find all that information. And uh, you can take these bad records and uh, handle them. Either you can drop them completely or you can um, uh, send them uh, for some further processing to someone. Say that, hey, look at these records and see why they are bad records. With this information about where they are found and what was the uh, reported issue based on the quality rule or you can fix them in the place itself. Uh, so these all features are available. Let's have a look at them. So if you look at this uh, advanced mode data flow, this is what is using data quality rule. And uh, let me actually scroll all the way to the left here. A colorful graph here. Um, so this uh, use case is basically taking data from actually a folder, looping through all the files from that folder, feeding that to this report model. And this report model, I'm, I'm pretty sure you, you all have seen plenty of times where we have sample orders and uh, you want to extract uh, the account information and order items information and so on and so forth. So this is the extraction logic. This one part is showing us the extraction logic. And the next step is the data quality rules. And here, what is happening is, uh, if you go to the properties, we just apply the simple rule, kind of basic rule here. Uh, the price range we have uh, specified, the price must be uh, greater than $200. And uh, this is a desirable range, and if price is not found in that range, it's a problem. So this is a simple data quality rule. You can have actually a collection of such rules, but to keep it simple, we just added one. And once the data passes through this rule, and let me actually do the preview, Okay, let me actually make sure. Yep, let's just change the file path here. So the idea is that uh, uh, when, uh, if I do a preview, it will show you all the files coming from here and then going into the report source and then going through the data quality and then moving forward. So now if I do a preview of the output here, you can see that all the records not meeting our criteria are flagged. The price is not in desirable range because we put a, a sample rule saying that the price must be 
greater than two hundred dollars. I know it's a very uh, you know uh, kind of a, uh, um, a rule that is uh, uh, very specific to a business where you are expecting that the price range to be uh, more than two hundred dollars and less than certain number of dollars. Uh, but it is very specific to your business. So the idea is that you write your own customizable rules and apply them anywhere inside the process. And the records not satisfying your criteria, they're going to be flagged. Now, what do we do with them? So what we have done is we took those records and created a logic here to split them into two different data sets. One is bad records and one is good records. Now it is going to your destination. So all the good records flow to your destination and bad records, they go to their own file. So this is the case we chose where you can see that all the bad records, not, satis uh, satisfying, um, not satisfying criteria, are sent to this another file and with exact information about this is the line number where it was found and why it failed, if you, if you have a cursor at the top of it, it will give you the error, the price is not in the desirable range. So this is a, a nice report about why this record is not accepted, where the data that is causing this error is found, and all that. So this can be sent to someone to verify this, look into it, find the reason, and either approve it or may, make some corrections and send it back, and that can be fed back into the loop. So this is just one use case, but as you can imagine, these uh, data quality rules can help you quite a bit in making sure that you are receiving only the quality data and the confidence in your data quality is 100%. So that's the purpose of having data quality rules. Let's move on to the last topic for the webinar today, and that is automation. And we are going to be looking at a couple of the options. The first one is automation, uh, and that is a folder watching, and second is uh, automation where we are doing classification of files. So let's start with the folder watching first. This is the step where, uh, or, or actually feature where uh, you are deploying the process, uh, deploying this entire model and steps around it to automatically watch a location on the network and actually in some cases you can watch email inboxes as well, FTP locations as well. But the idea is that you're waiting for the new data arrival. And as soon as the data arrives, you start processing it. And we're going to be having a look at that. So let's go ahead and have a look. So this is uh, the sample orders and for which uh, we created uh, a model that basically, uh, and actually this is the same report model that we, uh, that we have been working with. And then we have a data flow that actually works with that model and it extracts data from such sources, puts into an Excel destination. And this is the data flow that I want to deploy in runtime to, uh, to run live and, uh, and uh, uh, process any, any incoming files and feed that file into the system. So for that, you, uh, we recommend typically to use what is called a workflow. Workflow is the automation piece using which you can orchestrate your entire process. So this is the workflow that is designed for this use case. Let's have a close look. Uh, the step here that is the um, where the extraction is running is called run extraction. Basically, it's uh, running the data flow that we just saw. And uh, if I expand it, you can see that this is actually running the report source, the same report source internally, and uh, sending the data to the destination and doing all that. Here, the report source has a source file, and this source file needs to be fed into when the new file arrives. And for that, we have something called a context info, and that contains the dropped file information. We map that into the source file, so when a new file arrives, it is going to be fed into this uh, data flow, and this data flow is going to be using the newly arrived file as source and run the same data flow. So essentially, the same data flow is deployed to receive any uh, reports ex as long as they have the same structure and uh, use them as source and run through the system. So that's the idea of uh, this workflow. And uh, going back to the workflow, once it is run, uh, you can do multi uh, many other th things around it. And typically, this is how it is designed. Where the data flow has run, now I would like to add some notification as well. So notification here, you can see the couple of notifications added to it at the end. They're sending emails. Uh, in the case, uh, the errors, check errors step says there's no errors and it goes to this step. And if it found errors, in that case, it notifies errors. So you can have this entire thing running uh, basically on its own 
uh, receive file, run through the system. If it finds any errors, send you notification errors. Otherwise, it sends uh, a you know, successful email uh, <coughs> message. So let me actually just change this. Uh, I want to use my email itself here. Let's go ahead and see how it works. So we have the folder that is that is where it is deployed. So if you look at the server, and if I go to my job schedules, one of the job schedules actually is uh, to take this data, and you can see here, uh, this workflow automation is deployed already to run on sample six folder watching, and is watching this folder watch. So let's go ahead and have a look at that. So I'm going to take this sample orders uh, source file and uh, let me simulate the arrival of a new file. I'm going to dropping it here. So if I drop it, so the way it works is application is watching this folder live and uh, it will pick it up, take the file, uh, rename it, add a prefix at the beginning of the file and, and uh, you can see the name changed and you can see the prefix $proc10. So it processes it already. And, uh, uh, it used that data flow and uh, after using the data flow, deposited the data into Excel file and depending on the edit status, it should be sending out a notification immediately. So um, that email basically, uh, actually I think I did not save that part, but yeah, so that's how the notification works and it should be sending out email to, I, I believe Brittany should receive an email uh, uh, about uh, the, uh, the process was done successfully. So that's how this automation piece works. Now, I think we have uh, a few minutes left here. Let's quickly go through the last one. So the next, uh, actually the last uh, part of the webinar or last topic is uh, automatic classification of file types and matching with corresponding extraction logic. And this is what I talked about in the beginning. Uh, this is the last step in deployment. In a lot of cases, you will receive a mixed bag of files, different types of files. And uh, what you want to do is ideally automatic sorting of the files based on your own logic and then use some kind of logic to match them with the corresponding uh, extraction logic and run them in automation mode. And that is the ideal case and we have actually a sample that will take care of it. Let's have a look. So if you look at uh, this uh, files, uh, so I have, uh, so this is the files that I arrive and I'm going to be using this uh, for the sample. I received seven files in a batch and uh, I don't know what kind of files they are. The couple of them, they're PDF, couple of them, they're Excel, then few are uh, text files. And uh, these files, these files, uh, the text files, they contain sales orders. Um, the Excel files, they are basically some data about movie stars. And uh, the PDF files, they contain, uh, I believe, some contact details, some sample data for the contacts. So the idea is that they contain, uh, so let me open one for the contact and one for this movie stars. And uh, so you can see here's some name of a movie stars and uh, one for sales orders. So where we have text data. So uh, these are different file types and we are receiving such file types and, uh, and we are receiving a batch of these files. So now we have these files uh, and we want to use them in automated process. How would it work? So let's go ahead and have a look. So for each file type, if you see that I have one model that is, that is extraction model for sales orders, and it is able to handle all the data for sales orders. Then I have another model that extracts data for the movie stars Excel files. Then I have another one that extracts data for the context from the PDF, and they are like this. So these three models are designed to handle these three types of data, and now a batch of files arrive where it has multiple files of each type, and now it has to do automatic sorting and matching with the right model, and for that, I have a workflow, and this is, this is how it works. It's as simple as that. You point to the folder system, and it scans uh, all the files. So if I do a preview here, you will see that all the files are uh, listed here, the PDF files, the Excel files, and TXT files uh, with the names uh, of the files. And the logic matching, uh, what we are doing is we are looking at the file name and figuring out what type of file it is and which uh, flow it belongs to. So if I do a preview here, you will see that
we have matched the, uh, the contact details PDF with the contacts uh, data flow. Movie stars Excel with the movie stars data flow. Sales orders, all of them, they're matching with the orders.df. So these, this matching part is done, and once the matching is done, we know which flow to run, and we pass it on uh, to the next step. So the next step basically takes the source files and uses the right data flow to run it. So this workflow basically automates the process from end to end, figuring out what, how, what type of file it is and which data flow it matches with and use that. So that's the, you know, the automatic classification and uh, handling the files uh, depending on um, the type of file. So we have a few minutes to go through the Q&A and uh, I believe we are running close to the, to the time, but we would like to answer all the questions. We'll be hanging around here after uh, the time is up as well. So uh, please feel free to, st to, to stick around and ask any, any further questions. So let's go ahead and actually start with the questions. Uh, so I'm starting with the very first question uh, from Daniel Hardy. Uh, the question is, uh, does designer have access to dynamically access uh, destination outputs, such as databases, uh, etc.? Uh, does designer have access? Uh, yeah. OK, so I think I understand your question correctly. Yes, the designer does have access to dynamically access any destination outputs. And you can change that. So basically, uh, let me actually uh, describe to you if you look at uh, this uh, this step, that is run data flow step, and here everything uh, that is a parameter to run a job is made a, is made a variable. You can pass on all these values. Like in this case, we are using the job file path as a variable, and we are passing that job file path itself. So the data file name itself, sorry, the uh, the data flow file name itself is being passed on as uh, as a parameter. So if you look at the destination here, in this case it is Excel, and uh, we have made it variable and we can find the file path and we can specify the file path. We can have actually uh, a database destination connection and where you can pass in the DB credentials or the connection information like the table information or where the database is and so on and so forth. You can specify that as well dynamically at the runtime. Of course, the designer time, you can do that. Uh, you, know, you have the toolbox and you can go to, to destination and you can pick and choose. But at runtime as well, you are able to make a change. All right, moving to the next question. And this is about, uh, can regular expressions be used to find the start position? Yes, definitely yes. Uh, regular expressions are supported uh, uh, to find patterns. So in the patterns, when we specify the constant keywords and variables, uh, one option is to specify uh, your regular expressions. We support that. You just type it in and you, you check off that box that says that it is a regular expression and we'll take care of it. Okay, the next question is, uh, can system recognize duplicates based on multiple data elements? Uh, that is, if name and code combination is duplicated in another row, keep only one. Yes, definitely. Uh, for this question, actually, let me answer this in a little bit of details. So if you look at this entire process, this process uh, of extraction and, in, and actually integration, uh, integration is divided into two parts. The first part is extraction, where you run the extraction logic and get the data out of the model using the model uh, from the file. And the second step is when you do any kind of transformations. And uh, what we recommend is keep the first step, the extraction step, kind of simple, where you extract the raw data. And once you have the data available, make use of these data flows. So, And here we have tons of functionality to handle that. So these data flows, if you look at the toolbox, it comes with all the features to handle any kind of transformation that you want to do with the data. And uh, deduplication is a very common thing where we have actually built-in features to handle uh, um, if the data is already in the destination, you can skip it. If you want to check it on the source side itself, there also we have features to handle that. So you can verify if the data has been handled already, skip it. Or if you want to update it and so on and so forth, you can do that. All right, uh, the next question is, uh, can we use a report model generated for worksheet A to extract data from worksheet B? Worksheet A and B contain the same column and data type, only the data differs. Of course, yes. So the way it works is if you have, uh, let me actually see if I have example here. I believe uh, we have uh, some Excel files here. There we go. So for Excel files, we have uh, this report model. So if you go to, the report model um, properties, and you will see that uh, when you point to the um, to the file, there's a worksheet, 
uh, available and you can pick and choose which worksheet you want to read from and uh, you can change the worksheet where you are reading from and you can of course point to A and B as long as they contain the same data. Uh, in some cases, if you want to do it dynamically, you can do that too. At the runtime inside a workflow or, or a data flow, you can specify which worksheet you want to read from. All right, let's move on to the next question. One question is, uh, could you please explain how to extract an uh, XLSX file? Yeah, so actually we saw that example, I believe that is answered already. So we saw that uh, when you're creating a new report model, you, uh, you just point to your file and here we support, uh, as you can see here, let me actually point to this, uh, um, all the supported files and we do support in Excel files, all XLSX and you can see the two extensions, XLS and XLSX both supported. So we don't differentiate, we just point to your XLSX file and after that the process will remain the same. The next question is, does PDF recognition do OCR too? If yes, is it accurate? A very good question. Uh, we see this question quite often. Uh, we do have OCR functionality built in. So if you look at any PDF, uh, let me actually open one with a PDF here. This one is a PDF. So this is working on PDF and if you go to the properties, you'll see that there is an option to do uh, OCR, so run OCR, if I check on this, it is going to do OCR of the PDF. So if your PD PDF contains uh, image-based data, it does not have text, you can run this OCR and it will get you the text equivalent of that PDF and then work the text mining on it. Because essentially our tool is text mining tool. We are, we are mining text data from, the, uh, from your documents, uh, from PDFs and in actually some cases Word too if you have images and you will need to convert those images to text first and then work on it. So the OCR feature is built in. It will take care of it. Now com coming to accuracy of this, uh, our accuracy is as good or as bad as any other tool. Essentially uh, the OCR technology, uh, pretty much all the tools in the market, they use uh, uh, one underlying engine that is Tesseract and uh, uh, of course they, everyone has optimized uh, the top of it in a different way. Uh, we don't have our own technology, we license it from outside and we use it. We, uh, we chose to expose this feature to our users because some people needed it. Uh, but this is uh, this technology in general is not, uh, I would say, very reliable technology because uh, it does a lot of guessing. Uh, you know, when you're when you're reading from an image, depending on the quality of the image, depending on the quality of the scan itself. So there are a lot of moving parts there. Um, uh, you can get a good a quality, good or bad quality of your extraction. Um, uh, and if your source itself is good, and actually we have seen that if it is machine generated uh, PDF uh, text image. Uh, image-based text, then the quality is not as bad. Whereas if it is physically scanned document, where you know there are moving parts or more, such as you know what is the quality of the scanner, what was the quality of your uh, physical paper document itself, uh, you know there are smudges, somebody put their fingerprint on that, um, uh, you know the, the dust particles. That's, there are tons of things that can go wrong with the scanning, physical scanning. So you know physical scanned images they have some issues, but if the a scanned image is, is generated using uh, um, any other software system, uh, we have seen rarely seen any issues with that. Now, next one, uh, does the column recognition still work properly if the columns aren't aligned uh, properly? That is, if the same does not start the exact same spot in each row. So I believe we, we, we took care of it. This is basically the case where your uh, columns are floating. So uh, yeah, it, you can use the floating patterns and it will take care of it. The next question is, does the floating field trap automatically trim leading and trailing spaces? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, and this question is from Daniel Hardy. Uh, do you mind uh, giving a little bit of details of this question? Uh, does the floating pattern, uh, floating field trap automatically trim leading and trailing spaces? I'll give you a couple of minutes. I'll move on to the next question. Uh, the next question is, uh, if you have a list with multiple elements, would this work if no unique identifier? Yes, as I said, uh, you can use multiple patterns. So you can specify all the keywords uh, uh, in the multiple patterns. If you're using for the region level, even for the field level, you can uh, give a, a comma separated list 
uh, as the keywords and we can use that. Next question is, I'm curious about extracting uh, directly from HTML web pages. We don't do that. We don't direct. Uh, we don't do any any web scraping. We cannot, uh, and actually, we don't intend to go in that area. Whereas, if you want to just get the data from uh, some documents and all that, you are more than welcome to convert this to a PDF and extract it from there. Okay. Let's see. There is uh, another question here. Yeah, so the, um, there is a description from Daniel here. Uh, field start rows beginning before the data or ends after the data ends. Are those spaces trimmed automatically? Field start rows, show, field start shows beginning before the data or ends after the data ends. I, I believe you, what you're asking about is if it is uh, going beyond the data region, um, Okay, so yes, yeah, so we have here, well, it is, it, okay, I see what you're asking about. You're asking about if I have a, a field name and uh, <clears throat> if you have a space, uh, so like in this case, uh, ABC. So basically each field has its own field. If you go to the properties, it has its own length. And whatever length you have specified, we are going to be using that length. So wherever it is found, like in this case, if you see that if it is found at this location uh, and uh, starting position is like say character 10. So starting character 10, it is going to read 11 characters if you have specified it to be length based. So you can make the length of the field variable too. Yes, there is a space then, but no, you, uh, if, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. If you're, if you're talking about, if it is based on the keywords, so if it is based on the keywords, the way it works is it starts immediately after the keyword. It doesn't, it does not know where the data is starting. So uh, if you specify the keyword based search, so for example, uh, in this uh, field, uh, if we have to uh, have, uh, like say, if you want to get the data after the company, what you do is uh, company colon, and it will read after that, it will start immediately after that and read it 11 characters. So that data will be read into that field. Now, how you, what you do with that data, it's up to you. Now, in that data, if you want to just uh, take care of uh, you know, not having any space before uh, before the field ABC, I believe uh, if it is text data, it, it does it automatically. So it'll take care of uh, the spaces and trim it uh, from the from the beginning. Plus, we have actually tons of features to handle uh, text uh, processing. So if you're going to uh, the calculations, you can have those calculations uh, where you can specify to trim both ends. You can trim uh, the first end or the last end. Okay, I see another question here. Is Centerprise Data Integrator part of Report Miner Enterprise product? No, it is not. What we are showing you is uh, actually the Enterprise product. Uh, Centerprise actually is a superset of Report Miner. Report Miner actually is a part of Centerprise. Then there is a question about where can we see a full data sheet white paper on the full Report Miner Enterprise product and licensing? Uh, definitely, we will be more than happy to share that uh, with you. Uh, you can get in touch with your account manager or whoever you're in touch with in the uh, in sales team, and they'll be more than happy to give you one. Uh, there's a question about, I have a batch of files with the same type of information, but layout is choice of center. Can I match basics like name and address using software? That's a very good question. And actually, uh, in the matching, we, sh we showed the logic of matching based on the file names itself, but the logic is completely under your control. And in some cases, uh, we have seen that you can look inside the file and look at the names, addresses, and all that and figure out what type of file it is. In some cases, actually, we have seen even people using the uh, the, the mechanism uh, using which the file was sent. If it was sent using an email, then you can look at uh, the email address of the sender, and then you know that what type of file it is. So any logic that you use uh, in, your, uh, uh, in your current process, uh, that is manual process, and whatever logic you use to figure out what kind of file it is, you can pretty much apply the same logic when you're doing the sorting of the files automatically. All right, let's move on to next. 
Another question is, can data from uh, SQL Server tables from separate sources be incorporated in data, data flows? Yes, definitely. You can do that. Uh, we allow that uh, for the sources. Uh, you can bring in data from SQL Server tables. The only catch is that if you're looking at standard price uh, data integrator, that is our full product uh, that includes actually structured, semi-structured, unstructured sources. In that case, you will have SQL Server table sources. Whereas if you're dealing with a report miner, it handles only unstructured data sources, that is the document sources. Okay, there's another question here. Uh, in the worksheet A, okay, we created the model for equal four. Okay, it, uh, so this is this question is from Ajay Krishnamurthy. Uh, Ajay, uh, uh, your question looks like uh, it is specific to a use case that you have been working with. Uh, please feel free to send this question to support, and they'll be more than happy to help you with this. Okay, so there's another question. In the case of large data files, more than 5,000 lines, for instance, it is always necessary to the other options to increase the line count. Uh, interesting question here. So 5,000 lines that we see in the report, and actually let me show you the context here. So if you go to the properties here, you will see that uh, uh, by default, the line count is 5,000 here. And uh, let me describe to you what is meaning of it. So this 5,000 line count is basically the line shown to you in the designer. So remember that when you're building this uh, model, you are doing the design time. You're not really actually running um, this this job yet. And uh, for viewing the data, sample data, you're looking at 5,000 lines. And we put that limit, uh, a reasonable limit, to show that uh, and not to, to, to overburden the, the memory because, you know, in some cases, if you do the entire file and file is a few gigabytes, you don't want to load the entire file into the designer. So that's the reason we we put a 5,000 line limit. But it does not mean that it is going to be uh, uh, processing only those records. It is only for the display at the design time to, view, uh, to preview and to look at the data and all that. When the application actually runs, the engine is going to scan the enti entire file and process it. So that 5,000 line count is uh, specific specifically ap applicable to what you're seeing on the designer. You can change it, uh, it's up to you. Uh, if you want to see more lines, in some cases, you know, if you have 10,000 lines and you want to see all of them, you can change that line count and you can see all of them. So there is no restriction on that. You can have 100,000, you can have 500,000, but just be mindful that you know, this is, you're loading all that data into the memory here. Okay, um, let's see. So that's about it. I think that was the last question, and we have covered all the questions. I think we went over the time by a little bit, but uh, we are happy that we are able to answer all your questions. We got uh, quite a few really good questions, uh, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, everyone enjoyed the presentation and uh, um, the examples. Uh, we would like to thank you again for joining us. If you have uh, any questions about anything specific here, uh, you can send an email to support at estela.com for your questions. And of course, if you're a customer, you already know that. Uh, if you're not a customer, you're more than welcome to get in touch with our sales team to have a customized uh, live demo for you. Uh, you can send an email to sales at estela.com in that case. If you want to learn more about our products, go to our website. That is www.estela.com. Thank you again for joining us today. Have a wonderful day to yourself.